so actually I will <laughs> yeah it's definitely recording <laughs> good to know okay so um, talking about dynamic analysis so um, last week we started talking about malware analysis and how we go about um, analyzing an executable binary file that um, isn't running and now I'm just going to talk briefly about um, the things that you can do if you're willing to run the malware and the, the way that you can the things that you can learn about the malware and it is um, a uh, it's an important step um, if you want to really understand some malware and you don't run it then there are certain things that you might miss so by running the software we can kind of like find out more about what it's actually doing and um, you know based on the you know what the actual environment that's running in for example so one example would that of where it would be really important is some malware tries to be clever to avoid being um, you know analyzed so sometimes it'll check a register value and if the value is like set a certain way it w will like change the behavior of the program so it'll just like fall into an infinite loop or something and do nothing um, but, and it'll the reason it does that, for example, would be when you unpack the code, the unpacker might actually be using certain registers, and it's clever enough to go, oh, I'll just check whether that register is set. If not, it might be, you know, I might not actually be running directly after being unpacked. So it tries to be clever to make things difficult. So doing dynamic analysis lets us just run the malware and see what happens. Um, but obviously it's important when you're doing that that you're in a safe environment you're not just going to run some malware on your main production server to see what it does. Obviously, you have like a separate session, that, um, a separate computer that is, you know, isolated that you can try these things out on. So, um, you, for example, you might use a virtual machine um, and you would also make sure that the host that runs those virtual machines for your malware is fully up to date and, you know, unlikely to be um, vulnerable to attack um, but you know you never know Thing, some malware will make quite an effort to escape from a virtual machine and infect you know the host computer and it, it is possible so you just you know you need to make sure that you um, you know your software is up to date and not easily attacked Could be either way. Could be either way. The just over the network is the easiest way because obviously that you can just start talking to your IP address if you're also on the same network. If your PC is also on that network that the VM's on, which usually it will be, then you can start talking to that to your computer obviously and try and you know exploit a vulnerability that's there. But also it might be that the actual interface to the you know virtualization layer there might be a vulnerability in there. Um, it's less less likely, but possible. Uh, so there, were, for example, there was an exploit, uh, a vulnerability in Zen recently, um, so which is hypervisor that runs VMs, and as a result, Amazon needed to close, like shut down their entire cloud service um, for like a short amount of time to update that software because it's like a key component in their stack. Um, that was Zen X E N, which is like a it's like a server based alternative to like the virtualization software like we're using desktop virtualization like um, VMware um, player and um, and like VirtualBox which are like desktop ones but um, Zen is kind of like a server based same kind of thing uh, so yeah there are it could be vulnerabilities there so you need to be careful um, but if you've got a fully up-to-date system and you're doing all the right things, it's, you know, it's not that um, likely that malware will be able to escape. Because you know, if, if the VM is doing its job, it should be isolating the software within that virtual virtualized environment. Um, uh, so yeah, but there's something to consider. Uh, there's a few ways you can detect whether you're in a VM, and if you um, so like Metasploit can do that for you, Metaprotor, um, or those post exploitation modules that once you compromise system, you can use uh, like check VM, and it will tell you whether it thinks you're in a in a VM. 
there's a few what dead giveaways if you've got a network card called that's like created by VMware then probably you're in, you know in a virtualized environment so there are certain like um, hardware layers that often used by virtualized machines so it will detect oh that looks like I'm in a VM like risk like CPU usage and stuff like that you can you can like do cleverer things as well to try and detect it yeah sometimes like on um, in like VMware for example you've got a choice of like if for your network card for example you can choose between three or so or you know a couple of different ones that um, that it can virtualize and um, but yeah, if you're willing to like code it I guess you could make it look like anything yeah. but typically there'll be like a set like hardware that it uses um, so the operating system sees it as like for the network card the MAC address literally is you know the starts with um, like a VMware specific um, value, um, but for something like the um, video card, it might use like a standard Intel, thing, like emulate some standard thing. But sometimes it'll literally just be like specific to the VM. So there are a few things that can give away the fact that you're in a VM. Um, but nowadays everything's in a VM, right? Like probably nearly every server that you visit, every website that you visit on um, in your web browser, the chances are quite a lot of them are running in VMs because it's just like that's the way the cloud works. So you can do cloud provisioning and move the, you know, that virtual machine across different servers and things like that. So the fact that you're in a VM isn't as much of a giveaway as it was in the past that something was fishy. So for exam example, um, if you hacked into a machine and you see it's a VM, it's like, oh, it must be a honeypot or something, so I won't do it, do anything interesting. But actually, a lot of stuff runs in VMs nowadays. But some malware still does check for being in a VM and actually just won't execute it all in a VM. Because if that's not their target, then they just want to stop people from analyzing the, you know, what it's doing. So it will just detect, no, no, this looks suspicious, I won't run. Or I'll do something slightly differently. Yeah. What should I do from there? Well, it's a good way of learning about like how it all works. Like a honeypot. Um, there's a really good the HoneyNet project is a really good um, resource. They do they like release lots of honeypot software, and they have like books about about it all. And it, it's valuable for a few reasons for research, finding like zero day malware and you know things that. Are out in the wild, but no one knows about it yet. So, so stealing someone's code back off yeah, yeah. So, you, so you find a new sample. If you run it through some anti malware and nothing detects it yet, then you know that's a new malware sample, and you let other people know about it and write rules to detect that malware in the future. Um, for like an organization, it's, it can be valuable to have a honeypot just sitting on your network, just to like see whether or not you're the target of an attack. And sometimes it might not tell you much because it could just be an entirely automated attack that just happens to find its way onto your honeypot. Um, but it might also um, let you know about some targeted attacks against your organization as well. Just like see what they're doing and if it looks like they're actually targeting your organization that's like, mm, okay, we need to pay more attention to this type of attack, for example. Um, and just learning about what attackers do and like what, you know, a lot of to the time if you're running a honeypot you end up with like worms and things like yeah. attacking it um, and you, you can see you know what are the steps that they take and what changes are made to the system and everything like that so yeah it is quite interesting and something that we could have covered in this module um, and it just didn't really fit into the module content wise but you know we we'll, might be bringing that into the module later so but yeah it's it is like quite an interesting thing uh, honeypots are quite interesting good light like, learning tool um, so, um, yeah. What, so, what did you find on your honeypot then? Um, basically, I got one of the old XP machines, and then it started service pack one. Mm. I started it the other day, I was trying to activate something, mm. and uh, my CPU spiked from zero to one hundred. And every time I turn it on, it's a hundred percent CPU. 
yeah. alone constantly. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it doesn't really do much apart from that. <laughs> yeah. There was, a, there was an old saying that you, if you hook a Windows XP machine to the internet without having like the latest service pack and yeah. updates and stuff, I think it was it 12 or 16 minutes or something was how long it took like on average to be infected. Um, it, you know, if, if there's, you know, because older versions of Windows XP didn't have a firewall, for example, I think like the first release. Um, and, um, but I, I think it probably takes slightly longer nowadays mm -hmm. just because less people use Windows XP, so it'll be targeted less. Having said that, I think it's still 25% of computers are Windows XP, like home computers. It's like it's huge considering it's now insecure like there's no even if you fully patch it to every patch that Microsoft has released it's too you know they don't provide new patches anymore so 10 years old isn't it? yeah no, it's 10 years old is it 2002 2001 is it yeah it's a while ago alright <laughs> Wikipedia um all right. So the the question is, do you do you isolate the um this the malware when you're analysing it? So there there are pros and cons, right? There are advantages and disadvantages. Often malware will try and phone home, so it tries to connect back to the, to the attacker. Um, if you isolate it, then that will stop the machine from receiving instructions, which might be a good idea because you want to control what's going on and it, things might start getting really crazy really quickly if it can you know if it infects your computer and then it starts pulling down even more malware and everything like that. And before you know it, it's like an entirely different bunch of software that's running on your computer. Um, or also your computer that you're analyzing malware on, if you're connected to the internet, might be used to attack other people. And then if your computer was using an attack, then you might be in trouble for basically facilitating that. So you know, I guess you could argue that it was a honeypot and it wasn't me, but in order to argue that, you're still talking to um, the law, <laughs> you know, yeah, do you, it's probably best to avoid that from happening in the first place. Um, so yeah, so isolation is probably a good idea. Um, it also prevents the attackers from learning what your IP address is, because if they can connect back to themselves, then that gives them, that tells them something. Also, if they figure out that you're doing malware analysis and know your IP address, then you might become the target of more, you know, targeted attacks, which again, is something you want to avoid. Um, so, um, but on the other hand, you might need network connection to actually see what the malware does because it might not do much without network connection. So, um, you can do live memory analysis. So once you've got the malware started, you could actually start looking at the, um, the process. You can do basically all the stuff that we were looking at um, when in a couple of weeks ago in the live um, incident response, like live system analysis you could do that to the malware, right? So the malware is running, you can look at the process, you can look at what files it's accessing. You can take a core dump of the um, program, which is basically a snapshot of its memory. So as opposed to, you know, in, when you were doing the that lab, you did an entire dump of the entire RAM from the computer and you did like a kernel level memory dump, which is like huge, it's like a lot, everything that was running on the computer. Whereas if you're doing malware analysis, you might be interested in just doing a dump of a single process and just looking at its memory contents. Um, you can also attach to a running process with a debugger and then you can actually step through what it's doing, step through all the instructions that it's sending to the CPU, or like using a system call monitor to see the higher level steps of what it's trying to do. So like open this file, you know, send this command to the to the kernel. So that that's like that can be quite helpful. Um, you know, you might, if you're actually in an incident response situation, you might actually look at the malware while it's running on the compromised machine. So, you know, particularly if that compromised machine um, is already isolated, then you could look at it as a whole, like, okay, this is the system and here's the malware that's running on it, what's it doing, and start trying to analyze it. Um, but probably what you want to do is actually just copy the suspicious code to your environment that you're going to do your analysis in, which is probably a virtual machine. 
But also, as I was saying before, like a lot of stuff is running in a virtual machine already, which helps with malware analysis a lot. Like if you've got a server and it gets hacked into, and that server was a VM, it's perfect, right? You just take it. You can just cut, shut it down. You might even have a snapshot of your server before it was compromised, and then you, you know, you can easily compare what's changed on the system and all that sort of stuff. You know, in it as an additional to you know all the integrity management stuff that we talked about in the past. Gcol is a command on uh, Unix which you can use to dump memory contents of a process. So um, you can then look through the process's memory for strings or run it through like a debugger or, or whatever. So if you wanted to do that, you can just type like kill and then stop whatever the process ID is. You can gcore what the process ID what is, uh, and then which obviously you can get the process ID from ps, and then um, the whatever you want to save it as, and it'll just save that. And then you can kill off the process if you wanted to. And then you can do like look for strings through it, and then it might like expose all the environment variables for that malware that's running, um, and possibly uh, bash history if it was bash. Um, it might give you you know IP addresses that it's that are hard coded and email addresses and stuff like that. So it can be Has helpful. Been fixed for that exploit that you mentioned. Has what sorry? Strings been fixed for that. Uh, <laughs> um, it might be, but in order to avoid the exploit, you can just add the dash a here. So yeah, good catch. So yeah, so it should be strings dash a, and then that, which does exactly the same thing, but it doesn't use all the clever processing that it tries to do. It, all it's trying to do is pull out like ASCII text. I don't know why it even tries to be clever, but it try it does try and be clever. And as you pointed out, there was a a, a, a vulnerability in strings. So um, so looking at the memory dump, we might find like function names, system call names. And there might be some clues as to the the purpose of the malware. So you know, so we're assuming that we don't, we've got a system we don't mind infecting, and we're in a safe environment. So we can look at system calls, which is like the um, the layer between user space processes, so like a program, and the kernel, so the thing that's actually driving all the hardware. Um, so the system call is that interaction that happens between them, and that is one one interesting way of like listening to what a program's doing is just listening to system calls because a lot. Um, simpler than trying to debug the code, right? Because if you're debugging code, you're looking at every single step, every single CPU instruction potentially that, that process is doing. And you know it can be very helpful and you can get a wealth of information, but if you just want to know like what it's doing at a slightly higher level than that, system calls is a good option because then you can just see you know what what network connections it's making and what files it's opening and all that sort of stuff. Um, so everything that's security sensitive should happen via a system call, hypothetically. Um, and a lot of system calls are quite simple, so like opening a file. Um, but they can be complex and sometimes there are multiple calls to do one thing. So for example, to make a network connection, there's like uh, there's a whole series of system calls that basically set up the network connection and get it started. So it can be, you know, it's not super simple to look at, but it's more simple than, than debugging the code. So if you wanted to do that, you can use a strace command which um, on a Unix system, which will uh, basically show you all the system calls. And it basically, you just start up the program using strace, and it will show you what it's doing. So, yeah. um, and you can also attach to an existing process. So a program that's already running, attach the, the system call monitor to it, and then you see a list of all the system calls it's making. And if you want to know more, look at the man page. Um, so y you might want to actually listen in on network traffic. Um, you know, you might want to go a little bit further than that and like start interacting with the program and things like that. So um, library call monitoring is essentially um, the same thing as system call, except that it's not calls. It's not listening for calls out to the kernel. It's listening to calls to shared code. So you know, we were talking about before about um, dynamically compiled programs where it's using a lot of code that's sitting on the computer. Um, so you know the standard C libraries for example like most programs use. So you can listen in on the calls to those which can also tell you a lot about what a program's doing. If you're on, mon if you're on um, Windows you can use process monitor with, or procmon which basically it looks like this and it'll give you a list of all the processes on the computer and you can actually filter it down to relevant events, but it will show you um, like all of the files 
and all of the registry settings that a program changes. So it's quite helpful if you just want to know what a program has done, uh, like what, you know, and a lot of programs hide things in the registry in like really obscure places. Um, you know, there are some places where you start, you'd look first. So like, for example, on a Windows system, there's um, the run, oh God, it's been a while since, um, so under Windows, it's like um, current user, um, software, Microsoft Windows run, and under that set thing, there's like the, the list of programs that start when the computer starts. So a lot of malware will like insert itself into that. But that's like quite obvious. There's a lot of more obscure places in the registry where things can get hidden. And if you use like um, process monitor, you can actually see exactly what has been altered where. Could you, um, install a registry value anywhere and not actually affect the system? Um, so could it just create a new key on any particular? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, so any program can write to the registry in various places, and um, it may or may not be related to security. So you know, a lot of programs will say that on a Windows system, instead of having config files, everything uses a registry, right? So it's like a database. I'm sure you cover this in the forensic side of things, right? I'm, I'm sure you guys know about all this already. But it's basically it's a database of settings for the computer. And um, yeah, it could store stuff all over the place. There are certain things you can do maliciously within the registry, like you know, make it so your program starts up automatically. And there was some malware recently that was discovered. I think it was stored anywhere on the computer. The whole process was stored in registry. It's doing some clever things where like a registry key contains the executable code and so it was wasn't actually anywhere else so yeah you can do clever things with the registry but if you're using process monitor my point is you can see what's happening what it changes in the registry does it use uh, does it show network connection as well i don't think it does but you can use separately you can use process monitoring to do that so you can use wireshark um but you can also um use the two together to like get quite a complete pro, pro, uh, picture of things. And there is software that can combine network logs with uh, Procmon logs that will actually give you a diagram of how all these things relate together. So, um, so yeah, if you use a debugger, it'll show you all the machine, the, you can get it to show you the machine instructions so that um, you can attach it to a, a, so some examples of that is GDB, which is the GNU uh, debugger. Uh, there's Oli de debug, there's Win debug. Um, and um, you'll get you'll get a, um, a go at, you'll be using each of, we use GDB and Oli de debug um, soon, like um, in this module and the next module. This kind of topic about malware, it links in really well with what we're doing next semester. So next semester we're looking at exploit development and things like that, which involves like looking at um, stepping, th using a debugger, stepping through the code, looking at the machine instructions and figuring out like how do we cause a buffer overflow for this program, for example. So that's like the, the link. And we'll go into a lot more detail next semester and you'll actually understand it all properly. Um, but this is just like a taste of that, I guess. and. Um, we don't actually look back at malware analysis, but it's all is quite closely related. Uh, so you can you can connect a debugger to a running process, and you can you know step through the program. You can look at all the mem the the memory values. So you can look at memory contents. You can look at um, if you've got source code, you can even like look at variable values and things like that. Um, so yeah. If you don't have the source code, you can still step through the assembly code. So that's like the low-level instructions of what's happening. That's how you do it in GDB. Um, a higher-level way of doing all this sort of stuff is actually um, to basically just run the malware in an isolated environment and just save the changes made and um, record all the activity, and then like compare you know what files exist now that didn't when the program started. So there are some sandboxes that will like sandboxed. Um, virtual machines that can do that for you. So there's um, Cuckoo uh, is an open source. Um, it, it's, it's really good. Basically you can um, upload a sample and it will run it and generate a report. And there's an online version of that malware. 
um, which we can look at here. Um, so this is quite cool. So you can actually like upload your sample to this service and it will generate the report for you. It's just Cuckoo running on a shared server that they've opened up to the internet. So you can um, you can upload your own sample and um, you know get the report, which is really cool. And just as well because it's quite hard to set up Cuckoo and get it working. Um, I mean it's. That as far as I mean, I had a quick look and I couldn't find a VM that already had it all set up and ready to go. And you can install it all from source, but um, there's you know there's dependencies and everything like that. It's not doesn't seem to be available in package management on popular versions of Linux. So um, so yeah, th there's, there's an online service that you can try. Zero One is um, basically it's a virtual machine that is running Wine. Which is the Windows is not an emulator. Emulator, it's like a Windows emulator, um, so that you can run a like Windows program on a Linux system. But it, you upload the malware sample to that, and it runs it in Wine and uses it to record what it's doing on the system. Um, so that's kind of cool and worth another another way of generating reports and doing some analysis on what a program's doing. I guess the main disadvantage of that would be Wine's not always perfect at you know being a Windows system so you might actually it might not run properly it might get slightly different results than it would in, on an actual Windows system what is, what is Wine? Does it convert like it's not a virtual machine is it? No it's not a virtual machine it's it's an emulator but it's not uh, so Wine stands for Wine is not an emulator, it's a recursive acronym. It's a project so that you can run Windows executables on Linux. It provides an API abstraction so that you... It, the reason they say it's not an emulator is because it doesn't actually try and emulate the Windows internals, but it's an API layer so that it provides the same system call interface that. Windows provides. I, th I hope I got that right. The, it provides the same interface, so the same system calls, except that instead of doing the Windows stuff, it uses all the Linux right? stuff to uh, do those same things and then comes back with the results back to the program kind of thing. So you don't actually need anything from Windows on your computer to run Windows programs. And it's actually quite good. Like, you know, I've run a num number of programs in the past. Like, I used to have. Um, I haven't done it for a while, but I've, I, you know, I had Word with EndNote and everything running in Wine, and it all worked fine like years ago. Um, so it works quite well, but it's not perfect. And you can import Windows DLLs. So if you've got, like, if you've got a certain game that you want to run on Linux, kind of like you might be forced to use Wine because they don't have a Linux version of the game, and then that's when things might be a bit funny. Like it might not quite work for certain situations or like something might not display properly on the screen. But you'd be surprised it's like considering someone's had to reverse engineer the entire behavior of Windows without looking at any of the Windows code, it's pretty pretty damn impressive. Um, so yeah, that's what, that's what one is. So sandboxy, just using a sandbox is another alternative but probably the least safe of these options. So sandbox tries to secure your computer by controlling what a process does. And if the sandbox is doing its job correctly, then it's safe, right? So if we trust that sandbox is coded well and the, the rely on the fact that the, the malware probably isn't going to be trying to escape from the sandbox because like, I think at the moment, especially like it's not something that's going to happen very often, for example, running under sandboxy. So um, I actually do recommend if any of you guys actually use Windows still for whatever reason, Sandboxy is great for um, just really easily sandboxing a process that you don't trust. So it will have like a separate copy of all the files that you changed, um, and it 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 can access all the files on your computer, but it can't write to them, and you get to like audit, like vet which of the changes you accept back onto your main system. So for example if you were going to like run some code that you thought was a bit dodgy and didn't know whether you trusted it, you could run it in the sandbox. Um, so yeah, it is, it is good. So in conclusion, malware analysis uh, can give you like loads of information about malware. 
Uh, you, it helps you in an organization because you can look at incident, re incident related questions like what happened, what did this malware do on the computer? And it can also help with like technical details like finding out about it. So we've talked about static analysis and dynamic analysis and there's some readings. Okay.